Chapter 9 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Chapter 9 of Book 1 Of the Profits of Stock. The rise and fall in the profits of stock depend upon the same causes with the rise and fall in the wages of labor, the increasing or declining state of the wealth of the society, but those causes affect the one and the other very differently. The increase of stock, which raises wages, tends to lower profit. When the stocks of many rich merchants are turned into the same trade, their mutual competition naturally tends to lower its profits and when there is a like increase of stock in all the different trades carried on in the same society, the same competition must produce the same effect in them all. It is not easy, it has already been observed, to ascertain what are the average wages of labor, even in a particular place and at a particular time. We can, even in this case, seldom determine more than what are the most usual wages. But even this can seldom be done with regard to the profits of stock. Profit is so very fluctuating that the person who carries on a particular trade cannot always tell you himself what is the average of his annual profit. It is affected not only by every variation of price in the commodities which he deals in, but by the good or bad fortune both of his rivals and of his customers, and by a thousand other accidents to which goods, when carried either by sea or by land, or even when stored in a warehouse, are liable. It varies, therefore, not only from year to year, but from day to day, and almost from hour to hour, to ascertain what is the average profit of all the different trades carried on in a great kingdom must be much more difficult, and to judge of what it may have been formerly, or in remote periods of time, with any degree of precision, must be altogether impossible. But though it may be impossible to determine, with any degree of precision, what are or were the average profits of stock, either in the present or in ancient times, some notion may be formed of them from the interest of money. It may be laid down as a maxim, that wherever a great deal can be made by the use of money, a great deal will commonly be given for the use of it, and that, wherever little can be made by it, less will commonly be given for it. Accordingly, therefore, as the usual market rate of interest varies in any country, we may be assured that the ordinary profits of stock must vary with it, must sink as it sinks, and rise as it rises. The progress of interest, therefore, may lead us to form some notion of the progress of profit. By the 37th of Henry the Eighth, all interest above 10% was declared unlawful. More, it seems, had sometimes been taken before that. In the reign of Edward the Sixth, religious zeal prohibited all interest. This prohibition, however, like all others of the same kind, is said to have produced no effect, and probably rather increased than diminished the evil of usury. The statute of Henry the Eighth was revived by the 13th of Elizabeth, cap 8, and 10% continued to be the legal rate of interest till the 21st of James I, when it was restricted to 8%. It was reduced to 6% soon after the restoration, and by the 12th of Queen Anne to 5%. All these different statutory regulations seem to have been made with great propriety. They seem to have followed, and not to have gone before, the market rate of interest, or the rate at which people of good credit usually borrowed. Since the time of Queen Anne, five per cent seems to have been rather above than below the market rate. Before the late war, the government borrowed at three per cent, and people of good credit in the capital and in many other parts of the kingdom at three and a half, four, and four and a half per cent. Since the time of Henry the Eighth, the wealth and revenue of the country have been continually advancing, and in the course of their progress their pace seems rather to have been gradually accelerating than retarded. They seem to not only have been going on, but to have been going on faster and faster. The wages of labor have been continually increasing during the same period, and in the greater part of the different branches of trade and manufactures, the profits of stock have been diminishing. It generally requires a greater stock to carry on any sort of trade in a great town than in a country village. The great stocks employed in every branch of trade, and the number of rich competitors, generally reduce the rate of profit in the former below what is in the latter. But the wages of labor are generally higher in a great town than in a country village. In a thriving town, the people who have great stocks to employ frequently cannot get the number of workmen they want, and therefore bid against one another in order to get as many as they can, which raises the wages of labor and lowers the profits of stock. In the remote parts of the country there is frequently not stock sufficient to employ all the people who therefore bid against one another in order to get employment, which lowers the wages of labor and raises the profits of stock. 
In Scotland, though the legal rate of interest is the same as in England, the market rate is rather higher. People of the best credit there seldom borrow under 5%. Even private bankers in Edinburgh give 4% upon their promissory notes, of which payment, either in whole or in part, may be demanded at pleasure. Private bankers in London give no interest for the money which is deposited with them. There are few trades which cannot be carried on with a similar stock in Scotland than in England. The common rate of profit, therefore, must be somewhat greater. The wages of labor, it has already been observed, are lower in Scotland than in England. The country, too, is not only much poorer, but the steps by which it advances to a better condition, for it is evidently advancing, seem to be much slower and more tardy. The legal rate of interest in France has not, during the course of the present century, been always regulated by the market rate. In 1720, interest was reduced from the twentieth to the fiftieth penny, or from five to two per cent. In 1724 it was raised to the thirtieth penny, or to three and a third per cent. In 1725 it was again raised to the twentieth penny, or to five per cent. In 1766, during the administration of Mr. Laverty, it was reduced to the twenty-fifth penny, or to four per cent. The Abbe Terre raised it afterwards to the old rate of five per cent. The supposed purpose of many of those violent reductions of interest was to prepare the way for reducing that of the public debts, a purpose which has sometimes been executed. France is, perhaps in the present times, not so rich a country as England, and though the legal rate of interest has in France frequently been lower than in England, the market rate has generally been higher, for there, as in other countries, they have several very safe and easy methods of evading the law. The profits of trade, I have been assured by British merchants who had traded in both countries, are higher in France than in England, and it is no doubt upon this account that many British subjects choose rather to employ their capitals in a country where trade is in disgrace, than in one where it is highly respected. The wages of labor are lower in France than in England. When you go from Scotland to England, the difference which you may remark between the dress and countenance of the common people in the one country, and in the other, sufficiently indicates the difference in their condition. The contrast is still greater when you return from France. France, though no doubt a richer country than Scotland, seems not to be going forward so fast. It is a common and even a popular opinion in the country that it is going backwards, an opinion which I apprehend is ill-founded, even with regard to France, but which nobody can possibly entertain with regard to Scotland who sees the country now and who saw it twenty or thirty years ago. The province of Holland, on the other hand, in proportion to the extent of its territory and the number of its people, is a richer country than England. The government there borrow at two per cent, and private people of good credit at three. The wages of labor are said to be higher in Holland than in England, and the Dutch, it is well known, trade upon lower profits than any people in Europe. The trade of Holland, it has been pretended by some people, is decaying, and it may perhaps be true that some particular branches of it are so, but these symptoms seem to indicate sufficiently that there is no general decay. When profit diminishes, merchants are very apt to complain that trade decays, though the diminution of profit is the natural effect of its prosperity, or of a greater stock being employed in it than before. During the late war, the Dutch gained the whole carrying trade of France, of which they still retain a very large share. The great property which they possess, both in French and English funds, about forty millions, it is said in the latter, in which I suspect, however, there is a considerable exaggeration, the great sums which they lend to private people, in countries where the rate of interest is higher than in their own, are circumstances which no doubt demonstrate the redundancy of their stock, or that it has increased beyond what they can employ with tolerable profit in the proper business of their own country. But they do not demonstrate that that business has decreased. As the capital of a private man, though acquired by a particular trade, may increase beyond what he can employ in it, and yet that trade continue to increase too, so may likewise the capital of a great nation. In our North American and West Indian colonies, not only the wages of labor, but the interest of money and consequently the profits of stock are higher than in England. In the different colonies, both the legal and the market rate of interest run from 6 to 8 per cent. High wages of labor and high profits of stock, however, are things, perhaps, which scarce ever go together, except in the peculiar circumstances of new colonies. A new colony must always, for some time, be more understocked in proportion to the extent of its territory, and more underpeopled in proportion to the extent of its stock, than the greater part of other countries. They have more land than they have stock to cultivate. What they have, therefore, is applied to the cultivation only of what is most fertile, and most favorably situated, the land near the seashore and along the banks of navigable rivers. 
Such land, too, is frequently purchased at a price below the value even of its natural produce. Stock employed in the purchase and improvement of such lands must yield a very large profit, and, consequently, afford to pay a very large interest. Its rapid accumulation in so profitable an employment enables the planter to increase the number of his hands faster than he can find them in a new settlement. Those whom he can find, therefore, are very liberally rewarded. As the colony increases, the profits of stock gradually diminish. When the most fertile and best situated lands have been all occupied, less profit can be made by the cultivation of what is inferior both in soil and situation, and less interest can be afforded for the stock which is so employed. In the greater part of our colonies, accordingly, both the legal and the market rate of interest have been considerably reduced during the course of the present century. As riches, improvement, and population have increased, interest has declined. The wages of labor do not sink with the profits of stock. The demand for labor increases with the increase of stock, whatever be its profits, and after these are diminished, stock may not only continue to increase, but to increase much faster than before. It is with industrious nations, who are advancing in the acquisition of riches, as with industrious individuals. A great stock, though with small profits, generally increases faster than a small stock with great profits. Money, says the proverb, makes money. When you have got a little, it is often easy to get more. The great difficulty is to get that little. The connection between the increase of stock and that of industry, or of the demand for useful labor, has partly been explained already, but will be explained more fully hereafter in treating of the accumulation of stock. The acquisition of new territory, or of new branches of trade, may sometimes raise the profits of stock, and with them the interest of money, even in a country which is fast advancing in the acquisition of riches. The stock of the country, not being sufficient for the whole accession of business which such acquisitions present to the different people among whom it is divided, is applied to those particular branches only which afford the greatest profit. Part of what had been before employed in other trades is necessarily withdrawn from them and turned into some of the new and more profitable ones. In all those old trades, therefore, the competition comes to be less than before. The market comes to be less fully supplied with many different sorts of goods. Their profit necessarily rises more or less, and yields a greater profit to those who deal in them who can, therefore, afford to borrow at a higher interest rate. Their price necessarily rises more or less, and yields a greater profit to those who deal in them who can, therefore, afford to borrow at a higher interest. For some time after the conclusion of the late war, not only private people of the best credit, but some of the greatest companies in London, commonly borrowed at five per cent, who before that had not been used to pay more than four and four and a half per cent. The great accession, both of territory and trade, by our acquisitions in North America and the West Indies, will sufficiently account for this, without supposing any diminution in the capital stock of the society. So great an accession of new business to be carried on by the old stock must necessarily have diminished the quantity employed in a great number of particular branches, in which the competition being less, the profits must have been greater. I shall hereafter have occasion to mention the reasons which dispose me to believe that the capital stock of Great Britain was not diminished even by the enormous expense of the late war. The diminution of the capital stock of the society, or of the funds destined for the maintenance of industry, however, as it lowers the wages of labor, so it raises the profits of stock, and consequently the interest of money. By the wages of labor being lowered, the owners of what stock remains in the society can bring their goods at less expense to market than before, and less stock being employed in supplying the market than before, they can sell them dearer. Their goods cost them less, and they get more for them. Their profits, therefore, being augmented at both ends, can well afford a large interest. The great fortune so suddenly and so easily acquired in Bengal and the other British settlements in the East Indies may satisfy us that as the wages of labor are very low, so the profits of stock are very high in those ruined countries. The interest of money is proportionably so. In Bengal, money is frequently lent to the farmers at 40, 50, and 60 percent, and the succeeding crop is mortgaged for the payment. As the profits which can afford such an interest must eat up almost the whole rent of the landlord, so such enormous usury must in its turn eat up the greater part of those profits. Before the fall of the Roman Republic, a usury of the same kind seems to have been common in the provinces, under the ruinous administration of their proconsuls. The virtuous Brutus lent money in Cyprus at eight and forty per cent, as we learn from the letters of Cicero. 
In a country which had acquired that full complement of riches which the nature of its soil and climate, and its situation with respect to other countries, allowed it to acquire, which could, therefore, advance no further, and which was not going backwards, both the wages of labor and the profits of stock would probably be very low. In a country fully peopled, in proportion to what either its territory could maintain or its stock employ, the competition for employment would necessarily be so great as to reduce the wages of labor to what was barely sufficient to keep up with the number of laborers, and the country being already fully peopled, that number could never be augmented. In a country fully stocked, in proportion to all the business it had to transact, as great a quantity of stock would be employed in every particular branch as the nature and extent of the trade would admit. The competition, therefore, would everywhere be as great, and, consequently, the ordinary profit as low as possible. But, perhaps, no country has ever yet arrived at this degree of opulence. China seems to have been long stationary, and had, probably, long ago acquired that full complement of riches which is consistent with the nature of its laws and institutions. But this complement may be much inferior to what, with other laws and institutions, the nature of its soil, climate, and situation might admit of. A country which neglects or despises foreign commerce, and which admits the vessel of foreign nations into one or two of its ports only, cannot transact the same quantity of business which it might do with different laws and institutions. In a country, too, where, though the rich or the owners of large capitals enjoy a good deal of security, the poor or the owners of small capitals enjoy scarce any, but are liable, under the pretense of justice, to be pillaged and plundered at any time by the inferior mandarins, the quantity of stock employed in all the different branches of business transacted within it can never be equal to what the nature and extent of that business might admit. In every different branch, the oppression of the poor must establish the monopoly of the rich, who, by engrossing the whole trade to themselves, will be able to make very large profits. Twelve percent, accordingly, is said to be the common interest of money in China, and the ordinary profits of stock must be sufficient to afford this large interest. A defect in the law may sometimes raise the rate of interest considerably above what the condition of the country, as to wealth or poverty, would require. When the law does not enforce the performance of contracts, it puts all borrowers nearly upon the same footing with bankrupts, or people of doubtful credit, in better regulated countries. The uncertainty of recovering his money makes the lender exact the same usurious interest which is usually required from bankrupts. Among the barbarous nations who overran the western provinces of the Roman Empire, their performance of contracts was left for many ages to the faith of the contracting parties. The courts of justice of their kings seldom intermeddled in it. The high rate of interest which took place in those ancient times may, perhaps, be partly accounted for from this cause. When the law prohibits interest altogether, it does not prevent it. Many people must borrow, and nobody will lend without such a consideration for the use of their money as is suitable, not only to what can be made by the use of it, but to the difficulty and danger of evading the law. The high rate of interest among all Mahometan nations is accounted for by M. Montesquieu, not from their poverty, but partly from this, and partly from the difficulty of recovering the money. The lowest ordinary rate of profit must always be something more than what is sufficient to compensate the occasional losses to which every employment of stock is exposed. It is this surplus only which is neat or clear profit. What is called gross profit comprehends frequently not only this surplus, but what is retained for compensating such extraordinary losses. The interest which the borrower can afford to pay is in proportion to the clear profit only. The lowest ordinary rate of interest must, in the same manner, be something more than sufficient to compensate the occasional losses to which lending, even with tolerable prudence, is exposed. Were it not, mere charity or friendship could be the only motives for lending. In a country which had acquired its full complement of riches, where, in every particular branch of business, there was the greatest quantity of stock that could be employed in it, as the ordinary rate of clear profit would be very small, so the usual market rate of interest which could be afforded out of it would be so low as to render it impossible for any but the very wealthiest people to live upon the interest of their money. All people of small or middling fortunes would be obliged to superintend themselves the employment of their own stocks. It would be necessary that almost every man should be a man of business, or engage in some sort of trade. The province of Holland seems to be approaching near to this state. It is, therefore, unfashionable not to be a man of business. Necessity makes it usual for almost every man to be so, and custom everywhere regulates fashion. As it is ridiculous not to dress, so is it, in some measure, not to be employed like other people. As a man of a civil profession seems awkward in a camp or a garrison, or is even in some danger of being despised there, so does an idle man among men of business. 
the highest ordinary rate of profit may be such as in the price of the greater part of commodities eats up the whole of what should go to the rent of the land and leaves only what is sufficient to pay the labour of preparing and bringing them to market according to the lowest rate at which labour can anywhere be paid the bare subsistence of the labourer the workman must always have been fed in some way or other while he was about the work but the landlord may not always have been paid the profits of the trade which the servants of the east india company carry on at bengal may not perhaps be very far from this rate the proportion which the usual market rate of interest ought to bear to the ordinary rate of clear profit necessarily varies as profit rises or falls double interest is in great britain reckoned what the merchants call a good moderate reasonable profit terms which i apprehend mean no more than a common and usual profit in a country where the ordinary rate of clear profit is eight or ten per cent it may be reasonable that one half of it should go to interest wherever business is carried on with borrowed money the stock is at the risk of the borrower who as it were insures it to the lender and four or five per cent may in the greater part of trades be both a sufficient profit upon the risk of this insurance and a sufficient recompense for the trouble of employing the stock but the proportion between interest and clear profit might not be the same in countries where the ordinary rate of profit was either a good deal lower or a good deal higher if it were a good deal lower one half of it perhaps could not be afforded for interest and more might be afforded if it were a good deal higher in countries which are fast advancing to riches the low rate of profit may in the price of many commodities compensate the high wages of labour and enable those countries to sell as cheap as their less thriving neighbours among whom the wages of labour may be lower in reality high profits tend much more to raise the price of work than high wages if in the linen manufacture for example the wages of the different working people the flax dressers the spinners the weavers etc should all of them be advanced two pence a day it would be necessary to heighten the price of a piece of linen only by a number of two pences equal to the number of people that had been employed about it multiplied by the number of days during which they had been so employed that part of the price of the commodity which resolved itself into the wages would through all the different stages of the manufacture rise only in arithmetical proportion to this rise of wages but if the profits of all the different employers of those working people should be raised five per cent that part of the price of the commodity which resolved itself into profit would through all the different stages of the manufacture rise in geometrical proportion to this rise of profit the employer of the flax dressers would in selling his flax require an additional five per cent upon the whole value of the materials and wages which he advanced to his workmen the employer of the spinners would require an additional five per cent both upon the advanced price of the flax and upon the wages of the spinners and the employer of the weavers would require alike five per cent both upon the advanced price of the linen yarn and upon the wages of the weavers in raising the price of commodities the rise of wages operates in the same manner as simple interest does in the accumulation of debt the rise of profit operates like compound interest our merchants and master manufacturers complain much of the bad effects of high wages in raising the price and thereby lessening the sale of their goods both at home and abroad they say nothing concerning the bad effects of high profits they are silent with regard to the pernicious effects of their own gains they complain only of those of other people End of Book 1, Chapter 9